What does quantum physics tell us about love? Quantum physics is actually the science behind the law of attraction. How do we make sense of ourselves? We are pure energy, all of us. And there's no real separation between my energy and yours. How do you keep hope alive in the face of unimaginable tragedy? Dr. Laura Berman, famous for her love advice, writing, My beautiful boy is gone, 16 years old. A drug dealer connected with him on Snapchat and gave him fentanyl-laced Xanax, and he overdosed in his room. Hi, I'm Andrea Morales. This week, Dr. Laura Berman on Nine Questions with Eric Oliver. Hi, I'm Eric Oliver. Welcome to the podcast. This week, I'm talking to Laura Berman. Now, if you haven't heard of her, Laura is a pretty famous couples therapist. She's written numerous books on topics ranging from how to have better sex to what quantum physics can tell us about love. Uh, For a long time, she had a show on the Oprah TV network, and she currently has this great podcast called The Language of Love. And she's also one of the wisest people that I know. But that's not the only reason I wanted to ask Laura my nine questions on how to know yourself. For outside of being really smart, Laura has also experienced just a lifetime full of personal hardship. Her first marriage ended in a painful divorce after she caught her husband having an affair. She later contracted breast cancer about a year after her mom died of breast cancer. And last year, her son tragically died. And what's amazing about Laura is how well she's kept it all together through all of this tragedy. Whereas most people I know would have been really crushed or scarred by these kinds of events, Laura has managed not only to survive, but to retain a deep soulfulness and a love of life. And she has a lot of great things to say. So I'm really, really pleased to have her on our first episode. I hope you enjoy it. If you would like to hear the complete unedited version of Eric's conversation with Laura Berman, head to 9-questions.com where you'll find a link to our Patreon page, where we are happy to make the full version of all of our podcasts available to our Patreon supporters. Laura, once again, thank you so much for coming on my little podcast here. Okay. Um, first question, what are you? I am a spirit having a human experience. Okay. Okay. Um, can we go into that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Okay. Uh, no, um, I am, you know, I, I am aware that I am not my body. My body is a vehicle that contains an aspect of my soul. Uh-huh. Um, I am energy in motion, just like we all are. Uh-huh. And, um... I'm a spiritual being that is having a human experience, just like we all are. Sure. Now, I want to, you're one of the smartest people I know, so <laughs> I want to I wanna get some clarity on these questions from you. Okay. Um, energy. Yes. How do we understand energy? Um, well, the way that I understand it is through quantum physics, which by no means am I an, you know, a scholar of, but I certainly have studied it extensively. And um, what we now know, really only over the past hundred years, uh, is, you know, it's something that, that Einstein, uh, uh, at the end of his life, called spooky action at a distance. He had no (laughs) academic term for it because it was like kind of turning his world on its head. Um, But basically, the bottom line is that we think and we perceive because all we have to perceive our reality is our five senses. Um, With the limitations of our five senses, everything around us, including ourselves, seems solid and separate. But on an atomic level, if we were to look at all of this through an atomic microscope that could see atoms, nothing is solid. We are all just atomic energy in motion. Um, And energy never dies. Our bodies die. But the energy remains. Well, I'm going to, on this, I'm going to skip ahead to question three, because I think this is the the appropriate time to ask that question. And then we'll we'll move back to question two. Um, Who are you? (laughs) <laughs> and that actually the question is who are you come up really who am i really yeah i am an expression of god's light 
I am a miracle, just like you are. Mm -hmm. That's what I really think. Yeah, yeah. And how do you understand that as differentiating from what you are? So talk me through that a little bit. Um, that's a good question. So what I, I'm not, they're both almost the same. There's not a huge difference. Who I am is probably more, um, as I think about it and try it on, it's more how I operate in the world and how I experience myself in relation to the world and what I am is an understanding of the essence of who I am. Mm -hmm. So who you are is kind of this vehicle that negotiates with the world around you. Yes. And then what is just the, is the awareness of what I am. That's, that's needing to to negotiate. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And experiencing it. And I do have this, I walk around, and I haven't always been this way. I would say it's ex- exceptionally so over the past year. But I walk around in the world, and the only, you know, I was trying to explain this to my therapist the other day. But I was like, it's like I'll be walking somewhere, and all of a sudden, my it feels like my viewpoint widens, and I'm suddenly aware again and again and again Oh, this is a movie. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Oh, like it's a video game I'm in right now. Um, And I don't mean that, like, that probably sounds crazy, but like, that's what I think we are in. I think, I really do believe that we are souls having a human experience and we come here to have, to be in separation and because we are part of the oneness otherwise, and to uh-huh. experience and rediscover ourselves, to reawaken to ourselves, because it creates a duality and a di- dichotomy that we can't experience in oneness. Yeah. And so we come here to grow our soul, to practice the lessons we want to learn, to have the experiences we set up, you know, loosely for ourselves, um, and that this is all in essence a video game that we sign up for. I think this leads to question two now, which is, well, then what's your purpose? It's evolving as the movie evolves. It's a video game evolves. Yeah. Um, but at its core, my purpose is to love and be loved better, to help people learn to love and be loved better, to model that. Um, and since I was a little girl, you know, it has always been about, you know, heal, learn, discover, and then teach. And I would say when I coach people, whether it's a friend or a client or whoever, you know, it's such a fundamental part of your worth, of your life satisfaction, of your own evolution to discover your purpose, that it's always found in what breaks your heart. Um, I think that's where our purpose is found yeah. or discovered is, you know, if I used to say your purpose is found in something you would do for a job for free if money wasn't an issue. Yeah. But that's really where your ideal job is found. <laughs> <laughs> and which can be obviously connected to your purpose, but yeah. I think your purpose is about what breaks your is found the beginning of it is found in what breaks your heart and i am aware that my purpose is definitely i wouldn't say it's changing it's like evolving what you say about loss and adversity and grief really resonates but i I think a lot of people don't get that because they're they're too busy reacting to the grief but the real wisdom is to push through the grief and see the grief as Oh, this is my moment to learn. Mm -hmm. And this is my moment to draw from this and kind of strip away a lot of the unnecessary things and kind of go right to my core. Yeah. And um, I I think this is what grief experiences do for us. I I often think of it as it's like uh, the tide goes out and then what's laid bare is this sort of jagged coral that's sort of at our essence that's yeah. there. And then we can see it. And the, the challenge is, of course, it's really painful. It's yes. sharp and jagged. Yes. And not pretty. And not pretty, but it's clear. Yes. Um, and then as the tide eventually comes back in, it's can we keep a little bit more clarity with, with each kind of movement in mm-hmm. and out of the tide? Yeah. And it really requires 
which I am a big proponent of um, on all things of going all the way into the belly of the beast. Um, and, you know, I call these things, I guess, you know, from, from a biblical perspective, it's like the desert, right? When Jesus was in the desert. Yeah. From, you know, my perspective, I call these experiences AFGEs, another fucking growth experience. <laughs> like these things that break you apart and break you open. Yeah. Um, that are always an invitation. Yeah. And uh, I've had enough of them at this point. Evidently, I signed up for a shit ton of AFGEs uh -huh. that I am aware that there are endless gifts in them. Yeah. I mean, it sucks when you're going through them, but there are endless gifts Yeah, if you allow yourself to go into it. What are your dreams telling you? They've changed. Um, for a long time, I didn't remember my dreams. Uh -huh. um, until recently, after my son died, I started having um, lucid dreams uh -huh. with him in them. Yeah. So if I call him in viscerally, physically, you know, if I call him in and move my body into a certain frequency, if I move myself into that frequency and I really call him in, then often I will have a dream where he is just a character in the dream or comes into the dream. And then I'm like aware that he's there and that he's gone, you know, that he's not alive anymore. But I snuffle, like I smell him and I touch him and I hug him and it's very real. Uh -huh. And he very good naturedly just kind of stands there and lets me do it. Um, but it kind of gives me a dose of him yeah, uh, physically that I don't get to have anymore. Um, and viscerally that I don't get to have anymore. But in terms of my dreams of the future, um, there have been periods in my time where I really had clear vision of like exactly what I wanted to uh, logistically create. And I'm much less interested in that now as I've developed more and more of a partnership with my essential self, higher self, you know, God, spirit, I'll fill in your blank there. Uh -huh. um, where I'm much more interested in cultivating how I want to feel than what I want to do or create or dream into. So if I dream for about the future, you know, it's really about regularly getting clear on how I want to feel. So I don't make New Year's, re I haven't made New Year's resolutions for many years. I just resolve for how I want to feel, which this year is joyful, connected, and peaceful. And so that becomes my litmus for everything. Is it something that's going to bring joy, peace, or connection, or all three, ideally? Yeah. And if not, no thank you. What moves you? Videos of kittens and babies really move me. Uh -huh. um, they do. Uh, no. you, you and... 500 Millions million other of people. Others. Yeah. Um, I have said actually recently, I've, I've been teaching this course in manifestation and I had this epiphany the other day and I, their assignment was to go and look at your explore page on your social media because what is there is where you are putting your energetic attention. Okay. And where attention goes, energy flows, right? Yeah. yeah. So if it's, you know, porn and politics, that's where your energy is going. That's what you're, fo you know, you're manifesting basically more of that tension and, um, intensity. Um, and if it's, you know, kittens and babies or yeah. lately for me, it's been farms and little houses, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, sorry, what was the original question? I went on a tirade. Tell me the question again. <laughs> Um, HGTV is what moves. Yeah. Um, what moves you? Oh yeah. What moves me? Yeah. Um, you know, what tends to move me is other people's, um, like when I'm working with people, I find that I get really moved when I, when they have an epiphany or that is like really soul centered and healing. Uh -huh. Healing really moves me when I see someone really getting it, whether it's through working with me or just in general or in a movie or whatever, when I see someone awakening to their 
truth in a really honest and beautiful way. Um, that really moves me. Love moves me. How do you open yourself up to your emotions? Yeah. Well, this has been an evolution for me. Um, and I kind of joke, my kids, you know, used to call me when they were little, a talking doctor, you Uh know, because that's their word for a therapist. But I've actually become a talking doctor who does a lot less talking because, I'm really become increasingly interested in, in the somatic piece because I could, it's very easy, even for a talking doctor, a therapist who's very comfortable with emotions, to stay up here, you know, in the head and intellectualize everything and articulate everything. And we learn early to disassociate to differing degrees, depending on the degree of trauma and whatever else we might have had. We learn to disassociate from our bodies um, and just take care of them in terms of their appearance or putting out fires of health related issues. But um, what I have discovered over the past five to 10 years is really and truly our body is a bridge to our soul. And when you can really, you know, I call it embodiment, like when you're really embodying in your body you have so much more control of so many things in a beautiful way, but especially your energetic frequency because you can start to, and I've worked with so many people, you know, mostly men, but women too, who just really aren't, don't have that vocabulary. They don't even know how they're feeling. Yeah. And so I will ask them just to identify what they're feeling in their body. Um, and we know that when you feel tightness in your chest, that's usually fear when it's pain in your back, that's anger. You know, there's sort of these somatic cues, but also each of us has an individualized way of embodying different emotions. What I learned 10 years ago, my mother died of what was ultimately metastasized breast cancer. And that, in fact, I was laughing, thinking about you coming to talk to me today because I was remembering that I barely knew you at the time. I obviously knew your wife, but I remember I was so beside myself that my mother, who was like my soulmate, was dying. That like I just saw you walking in the hallway of our kids' school. I don't even know if you remember this. You said, "Hey, Laura, how are you doing?" And I was like, "My mother's dying." You know, like I just. <laughs> do, you, do you remember yeah. that? Yes. You're like, what yeah. the hell? No, 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 no. It's like. Oh, <laughs> my mother's dying. You know, like, how can the world keep spinning? Right. right. It's like, um, I don't know if I can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a good day. Um, no, I wasn't expecting yeah, a yeah, response. Yeah. I just was like, my mother's dying. Well, you know, there's, there's an old joke that there's, there's nothing more tiresome than an honest answer to yes. the question of how you're well, doing. That's me. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm one of those tiring ones that never, that actually tell you the truth when you ask that question. Um, but I was in so much pain and I was shooting a television show. I was doing a radio show. I had three small kids. Like I was like, I do not have to, I'll, I'll deal with it like a pressure valve. I'll, I'll, but I'm going to find spiritual meaning here. I'm going to look at the bright side. I'm going to, you know, cause I have to keep functioning. I'm going to keep it in a box. And yeah. within a year I had breast cancer in the same breasts that she did. I Uh had none of the risk factors. It just randomly showed up. It was a really aggressive kind. I had to completely stop my life and go through chemotherapy. And it was one of the greatest gifts I ever received, not only because it was the first, I mean, what adult, unless you get seriously ill, stops their life. Like it was the first time and only time in my adult life till recently with this most recent one that I stopped my life. Yeah. Um, and totally reassessed everything. And that led to a huge transformation. But but what I really learned was that you cannot go over, around, or under the shit storms. You got to go through them. Or yeah. you're going to get sick, or it's not going to get any better, or shit's going to fly. And so that is what began my embodiment practice. And what I would say over the past year, when my son died... I knew, like, first of all, there's no way I'm checking out. Like, I got kids who need me and a husband who needs me, and I am not going to go. And if I'm not going to go, I have to be willing to go into this. And I I can't believe I did this, but I went to my husband 
probably a week after Sammy died. And I said, I have to leave for a week because I knew I like literally knew I was going to die. And I said, I am not going to survive this if I don't go to the woods and screech and howl and move this out. And this isn't going to be enough. You know, I have to keep doing this, but I have to go. And God bless him. He was unbelievably supportive. He needed me more than ever. And he let me go. Um, And I went into the Redwoods with a really dear friend who was masterful at holding space for that. And all of my healer friends came to help me on Skype or if they were nearby, came to visit. But I spent a week there and it really I I, it was like a PhD for my soul Mm -hmm. um, and really set me on the path to healing. And I've made it a daily practice ever since. Um, But when you can be in your body and allow yourself, this is what I knew for many years and practiced in smaller ways, but on steroids over the past year, that when you can allow yourself to go fully into a feeling, the visceral experience of a feeling identify you don't even have to think you just go to where the tension is felt and you just presence with it and put all of your awareness on it then your body just takes over and you cry or you scream or you pound or you whatever and it takes maybe 15 to 30 seconds whole process maybe three minutes and you are so much lighter and clearer of a channel then you know, energetically and focus wise and healing wise. Who's writing your life story? Oh boy. You mean my, my biography or my whole story? (laughs) Um, If you are prominent enough that someone's writing your biography, (laughs) then that's all you need to say. It's like, Oh, no one is writing baby. (laughs) No one is writing my biography, but believe me, it would be really, really juicy. Um, now who's writing my life story? Um, I feel like it's a collaboration, um, between, me, my soul, and my higher power. And we are co-writing it. All right, I like that. Um, and how do those negotiations <laughs> go? <laughs> well, I'm still figuring out how to negotiate with the higher power. Uh-huh. Um, that's not something that I was raised with. And I'm so jealous of people who were raised with a really healthy relationship, two-way relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I am just developing a two-way relationship. I would say I had no real relationship until 10 years ago, other than when I was a little girl. I had a really deep relationship, but that got conditioned out of me. And then, you know, past five to 10 years, I've had a one-way relationship where I was sort of asking or putting things out there and hoping, you know, the cosmic waitress responded. Yeah. Um, And now I finally, I would say over the past year or two, can really feel and experience that support and love and really anything we want we only want because we want a feeling you know you want that corvette it's not because you want a corvette it's because you want the feeling you're going to have when you own and drive that corvette yeah a friend of mine bought a porsche when we were young and i was like that's a really expensive sensation yes (laughs) yes everything we want every single thing we want is because we want a feeling Do you own your shit or does your shit own you? You got to ask my husband. <laughs> uh, no, I would say I I definitely own my shit. I know my shit. Put it that way. Uh, I know my shit. I own my shit. I'm not perfect at owning my shit. Nor, you know, I don't think anyone is. Um, but I definitely own it. Uh-huh. Um, how do you own it? I am really aware of my triggers, of my shadows, of my insecurities. I've worked a lot through the years to really um, accept and love them rather than resist them. Um, And they're much less powerful as a result. Yeah. Um, But 
I, you know, I make it a practice. I don't want to be friends with or spend time with or partner in any way with anyone who isn't willing to be friends with their shadows. Yeah. Because those people are really dangerous. Yeah. And they're really, not necessarily they're going to murder me, but they're emotionally dangerous and they're not going to, they're not conscious of their shit. And so they act on their shit. Right. They're like infants with flamethrowers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you do? What What's a practical strategy you do when you're really compressed and, you know, the trigger happens? I see this in myself sometimes. And it's like, I'm, my, you know, I'm, I'm in a state, my whole consciousness now is very scrunched down yeah. and I'm just caught in the maw of this like little infantile demon. Yeah. And it's just like, just buffeting me about like a little rag doll. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the good news is that you notice. Yeah. Like yeah. that is everything. Cause a lot of people don't even notice when that's happening. They leave the building, right? You notice, but you're saying you don't know what, you know, but, what do you do at that point? At that point, even once you know, I mean, noticing yeah. is a, you know, huge. Is huge. Cause then you can right. do something about it. Right. But so, then, uh, but even then, even when you notice it, yeah. then it's just like, Oh, right. And it's, you know, and, and it's resisting acting out and, yeah. and resisting acting out. So it is for me and what I recommend, what I always counsel people do, to do and I do myself is you recognize it. To me, that's huge. And then you excuse yourself, even if it means going to the bathroom for a minute, because you are now in persona. You're not, it's like trying, someone trying to talk to you is talking to a crazy person, yeah. you know? So trying to like in the moment, be a sane person when you're in an insane trigger is irrational. So you have to extricate yourself. And I will be in an argument sometimes with my husband where I'm triggered and he, we do this now and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm triggered right now. Like let's have this conversation later and I make yeah. sure to circle back, but there's no way we're resolving it right now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we do, we do that too. Sometimes I say, you know, we're just not having a productive no. conversation, but or Thea will say that, but the other one who's triggered is like, no, Fuck you. get back in here. <laughs> yeah. No, you I have mean, to have that yeah, agreement. Yeah, and it yeah, would yeah. piss me off so bad in the beginning when he would like call me to consciousness on my trigger because I'm in my trigger. Yeah. But um, you kind of make that agreement and you do it in a loving way. And hopefully you realize for yourself, you get out of the situation, you ground. So my favorite way to do that is you take really deep belly breaths. You have your feet on the floor. You imagine as you breathe in light flowing in through the top of your head, filling every cell. And as you breathe out, it shoots out your tailbone deep into the earth, anchoring you there. So you take like three or four breaths like that. A, it grounds you energetically. B, it calms down your nervous system. So you're a little bit clearer. Then you do a body scan and you'll immediately feel the sensations. And there's two ways that I find helpful to work with that. One is just literally in that moment, like what you're describing, it would, you know, what's the feeling? <sighs> okay, there's tightness in my back and in my chest and in my stomach. And let me just be present with that for a minute. And then you may want to scream, scream into a pillow or stomp or shake your whole body out or cry or something wants to move. Um, always when you're in those states. So you let it move. And then that's one way. The other way, and this takes some practice, so it's not something you'd be able to do um, right away, but it's something I love working with. It's um, a form of shamanic healing. And what I do is, you know, let's say I were to do that scan after grounding and I have just like all this density in my chest, and you're not trying to think through like, oh, I should have told her. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're just like in the sensations. And then I will um, take a really deep breath. This is going to sound crazy, but I swear it works. You take a really deep breath and then you blow that sensation out in front of you. Uh -huh. And you ask it to take a form you can communicate with. And you say, what do you want? And it will always tell you. You know, I want you to be right. I want to keep you safe. I want you to, you know, whatever. And it's that shadow that's right there up for the, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then um, you get clarity. You calm down your system and you're sane again. How do you find love? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm bumbled now. Um, you find love. Uh, you 
I don't think you find it. I think you call it in. And I think you call it in as a result or as a reflection of the degree to which you love and accept yourself. Like I found it to be true every single time that we will attract in and be attracted to someone who's operating at the same frequency energetically as us at the same emotional health level and who is a reflection of the wounds we're not willing to be with. That's why our partners are our greatest teachers because they're going to trigger everything. Mm -hmm. So um, what I have found working with so many people who are looking for love is that when I can get them to a place where they can really fall in love with themselves, it happens so easily and naturally. Yeah. In a million different ways, you know, not necessarily through online dating or matchmaking, you know, just like randomly. How do you get someone to fall in love with themselves? Um, it's a process of self-discovery, of self-inquiry, and most of all, of self-acceptance. And as I was saying earlier, it's about your cultivation of a spiritual connection, whatever form that's going to take. But if you can really do that and practice trusting that and being guided by that, that I have found is the quickest and most profound jump start to one's self-worth. See, I think this goes back to the theme of how when we're in grief, that's why that, that those moments are instrumental in that mm -hmm. process. Because when all the shit gets stripped away and we're just down to our bare bones, that's when we have to sort of make peace with what's there mm -hmm. at some level. And yeah. And we fully make peace. And it's interesting because I think that's the hard part if you're in some ways just muddling through the routines of your life. Yeah. Um, you're, you're too habitualized in your just ordinary goings about to really do that. It's hard to actually see yourself to become in love with yourself. Yeah. Or fall to... to Become in love with yourself. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You're just on the hamster wheel. Yeah. You're just, yeah, and you know, you're too caught up and mm -hmm. there's no, there's no leverage point yeah. there. And it usually takes something from the outside or some moment to shake us up. But that's that just God's love in action. Yeah. I think, I think that the universe, God, whatever, you know, scratches on the door a little bit and you don't listen and then knocks a little harder and you don't listen, or you don't want to listen, or you're too scared to listen, or you don't really want to do what you're being called to do, and then the next thing you know, the whole freaking house burns down. Yeah. But it doesn't have to happen that way. I think that's a that's a really, um, that's a straightforward way to get there, for sure. But it doesn't have to happen like that. It's the way it happens for most of us. I mean, Lord knows it's the way it happens for me, um, but it doesn't have to. Yeah. And I have announced that I'm done with, I don't need any more freaking growth experiences. <laughs> like I am committed to growth. I do not need to be broken open and apart. Where are you going from here? To lunch. No, <laughs> I am going, <laughs> where am I going from here? I have no freaking idea. I am just excited to see what unfolds. Uh, if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I would have had a very specific answer but I'm not interested in predicting the future anymore. I'm just interested in being in love and letting it unfold and trusting the joyful way that it's going to all happen. The worst thing that could ever happen has happened, so I'm not afraid of anything anymore, yeah. including pissing people off or disappointing people and yeah. it's really a beautiful place to be i mean it's not always roses and flowers like i go through my periods of sadness and pain and grief and loss and there's still things to process from what has happened before but when i think about my life everything's great you know i don't i can't i i, I have no conflicts there is a real sense of faith and comfort and fearlessness that makes it really easy to be excited about what's going to show up next, even though I have no idea. Well, once again, thank you so, you so much. You are so, so welcome. Hey, Eric. So what did you learn from Laura Berman today? 
I take away two things from my conversation with Laura. Now, the first one's about energy. At our most fundamental level, blower atoms or all the particles that comprise these atoms is really just energy. We are just systems of energy. Now, the problem, of course, is that energy is something that's really, really hard for us to know. It's pretty ineffable. But there are some things that we do know about energy. And one of the interesting things about energy is what quantum physics tells us, which is that energy is in sync, and it's in sync in some very strange ways. For example, the spin of some subatomic particles in one part of the universe can actually coincide with the spin of particles that are light years away. And Laura says that this kind of quantum prin principle also applies to us, and it's a way of understanding ourselves, and it's a way of understanding how our energies coincide with the energies of other people. So as we go through life, we need to be cognizant of the way that other people's energies affect us and the way our energies affect other people, because in Laura's vision of quantum physics, they're actually affecting each other, like in this very physical way. And so part of the task of living well is to be in touch with your own energy. Now, this brings up the second takeaway, which is how do we know energy if it's so unknowable? And the way to do this, I think, is through understanding your emotions. For if we think about what emotions are, they're really just energy states. You know, happiness has its own energy, and then sad has a different kind of energy, and angry has a different kind of energy, and so on. Now, the biggest challenge for a lot of us is, of course, then recognizing what emotion we may be experiencing at any given moment. Either we're so compressed in the emotion that we really can't see out of it, or maybe we're just not feeling any emotion at all at any moment in time. Now, one of the really wise things that Laura says is the way to connect with our emotions is by looking into our bodies, because one of the ways emotions work is through our physical form. So if we pay attention to our bodies, we can see our emotional energy at work. We can observe where we're holding stress. We can observe where we're having blockage. We can then say from that, okay, what is my energy doing now? And what is this energy that's presenting to the world? Now, what was great was Laura, I think, gave a lot of great tips on how to do this. And particularly talking about breathing and grounding and really sort of moving your consciousness down into your body. And when I think about all that Laura has gone through and her remarkable vitality and spirit and love and all the goodness that she sustains, it really makes me believe that she's on to something pretty good here. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe to hear more wisdom from interesting and insightful guests in the weeks ahead.